Vincent Bach, born Vincennes Schrattenbach, was born in Baden by Wien, approximately 40 kilometers south of Vienna. Bach started playing violin when he was six years old, but his teacher's strict disciplinary measures caused him to quit, and he picked up the trumpet instead. Even though his stepfather was not a fan of professional musicians, Bach loved the trumpet and saved up enough money to buy a used trumpet and begin taking lessons with Georg Stellwagen, the principal trumpet with the Vienna Tankunstler Orchestra. He had a lot of talent and quickly developed considerable skills on the trumpet. Although he had a love for trumpet, he ended up enrolling in a mechanical engineering program at the insistence of his stepfather. After graduating, Bach found employment as an engineer at an elevator factory. In addition to his day job, Bach was gigging three to four times a week in Vienna. During one of these gigs, an English opera house director offered him a contract for a concert tour that would pay him more money than his current engineering job. Bach accepted this contract, quit his job, and toured all over Europe, performing on the trumpet. In 1914, Bach landed in England when World War I broke out. Fearing for his safety and not wanting to be imprisoned, Bach pretended to be a Swedish citizen and boarded the Lusitania to New York City. Bach had no money when he first got to New York, but his playing abilities quickly landed him employment, first with Oscar Hammerstein's Lexington Opera, and later as principal trumpet with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Bach was also contracted to perform as principal trumpet with the Diaghilev Ballet at the Metropolitan Opera. Throughout the next few years, Bach remained busy performing, recording, composing, and he even authored a short pamphlet that would eventually become the art of trumpet playing. In 1917, when America entered World War I, Bach was drafted as conductor of the 306th Field Artillery Regiment. During his tenure, he became aware that the quality of mouthpieces and instruments that were available was quite low. He saw there was a great need for higher quality options for performers to choose from. After completing his service, Bach continued with his performance career in New York City. It was on a subsequent tour in Pittsburgh when a repairman convinced Bach that he could make his mouthpiece better, but instead of improving it, the repairman ruined it. Bach spent the next year trying to fix it, and it was during this time his mechanical engineering degree helped him to understand the relationships between cup depth, rim size, throat size, and back bore. Bach rented out a small space in the Selmer Music Shop at 11 East 14th Street in New York. He also purchased a foot-operated lathe for $300, and he began making mouthpieces for his own needs. One of his mouthpieces enabled him to increase his range by a fifth. When other trumpeters heard Bach play up to a high F, they all immediately wanted to have a Bach mouthpiece of their own. I find it pretty amazing that Bach got his first start after trumpet players heard him play a high F on the trumpet and they said, if that mouthpiece can do that for you, it's gotta be able to do it for me. I have to have one. Some things just never change.
Sometime after Bach started in the Selmer Music Store, he would move to a new, larger shop at 204 East 85th Street. After the initial wave of demand from Bach's acquaintances subsided, business slowed considerably, and Bach struggled to pay his bills. This prompted him to take out an advertisement in the most popular music magazine at the time and publish an article called How to Be a Wizard at the Cornet Without Practice. After this, demand for Bach's mouthpieces skyrocketed. He was able to hire two additional workers to help expand production, and Bach was forced to give up his performing career to focus solely on his business. In 1922, Bach moved to his third shop at 237 East 41st Street, and he began working on production of his own trumpets. In 1924, the first Bach trumpets were manufactured, and the improvement in quality over what already existed was clear. Players referred to his instruments as the Stradivarius of trumpets, a name which Bach later trademarked to great effect. Four years later, in 1928, Bach expanded again, moving to his fourth shop at 621 East 216th Street in the Bronx, and he also began manufacturing trombones at this time. In 1953, Bach moved his shop one final time to the famous Mount Vernon location. The instruments that came out of this shop are legendary for their incredible sound and are still sought after by professionals and hobbyists alike. In 1951, just before Bach moved to Mount Vernon, the horn you've been hearing in this video was created. It's a beautiful medium bore Bach trumpet with a type E valve block. This instrument is very different from the Bach trumpets that I have played in my career. So I reached out to someone who was a lot more familiar with vintage Bach horns to ask what makes these instruments so special and why might somebody want to play them in a world full of modern trumpets. I was fortunate enough to get a hold of Mark Hughes, the principal trumpet with the Houston Symphony Orchestra and a Bach artist to share some of his perspective about vintage Bach horns. So I have this 1951 New York Bach. It's a beautiful horn. Uh, it's a medium bore horn, which I thought was really interesting. And I'm just wondering, Mark, if you could share with us a little bit about uh, vintage horns versus modern Bach horns or modern trumpets in general. And then in what context might you actually choose to play a vintage instrument over a modern instrument? Just was curious for some of your thoughts on this subject. For me, I'm going to sort of answer the last part of your question first. Uh, when might I use a vintage horn all the time? I play every note at work. I can't trying to remember when's the last time I played. You know what? On piccolo. I played a modern piccolo because the, yeah. the other day. But generally speaking, I'm playing a vintage horn all the time. I found that the medium bore is so responsive and so well balanced that it actually is a pretty nice sounding horn. And it does, mine in particular, lights up 
like no horn I've ever had. I mean, the sound is unique and they're beautiful. They have a lot of fire in the sound. Go back and listen to early Doc Severinsen when he was just on The Tonight Show and it was still being filmed in New York City. He was playing on New York Box. I hear that burnishing quality of sound without it being pushed. So that's why I always go back to those, I think those vintage horns. These vintage horns, you just have to get them and you have to tweak them to your liking. And so all of my horns, I have set up in varying ways, but they're all to what I like. And I think th that affects the playability side of the horn. First thing you're looking for to me is the sound that you really, you know, you're going to be proud of and alive with. Then you just made it with playability. And, you know, that takes time. So with these instruments, you kind of have to go into them with uh, a little bit of awe and a willing to be a discoverer of sorts. Because as you work through these horns, there's a horn, I think, in every one of them. A really special horn, but you kind of have to find it. Yeah, so in, in summation, um, I think anybody that is interested in sound being the ultimate goal, I think these vintage box are unbeatable. It just, you may have to deal with a little bit of work uh, to get them to get the playability like you like. But uh, I think that's true of every instrument that's out on the market. As you get to be a refined player and know what you like, you have to let someone help you refine it to which, you know, playability is like you like. So, you know. Go with your heart, go with your sound. And when you sound good, you're gonna have a smile on your face. I think the story of Bach is pretty amazing. For him to have gotten a mechanical engineering degree to start with, most of us would think, okay, well, that's the end of his performing career. But for him to go on and having a performing career and then to be able to see some of the problems that performers were experiencing and then to have the knowledge and the skills to be able to actually fix this problem so much so that it created the legacy of Bach mouthpieces and Bach instruments, which has influenced all trumpet makers and all mouthpiece makers to this day. I think that's incredible. And to me, this story is amazing because it really shows there is a payoff in being able to embrace all of your unique strengths and skills, even if they don't necessarily seem like they're completely related to each other at first glance. All right, everyone, that's going to be all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. It was really fun for me to put together this video about Bach and to research it and to realize there's so much of a story that I didn't know. If you found it interesting or you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you would like the video and subscribe to the channel and let us know down in the comments what you thought of Bach's story, what you thought of the sound of this horn, or uh, what you thought of Mark Hughes's comments. That'd be great to know. Too. I have a lot of other videos for you to check out on Houghton Horn's channel, so I'd recommend you go do that, and we will see you in the next video.